I'm Sari Kimball, and I've done just about everything in the food industry. I have helped hundreds of packaged food business entrepreneurs, and now I want to help you make your delicious dream a reality. Whether you want to be successful at farmer's markets, online, or wholesale on the store shelves, food business success is your secret ingredient. I will show you how to avoid an expensive hobby and instead run a profitable food business. Now let's jump in. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. I am so glad you are with me today and I think you are just going to love this series that is coming up, uh, starting with this one, but I am doing a series all about sales. I know this is a place where so many of you guys get hung up. I've been playing around with this idea, kind of thinking through this visual um, in my mind of when you are a packaged food business owner, you are wearing three distinct hats. You have the chef hat, which most of you are really good at, right? This is the passion and the innovation um, all around your product, right? The making of it. You're just so excited about it. This is like the reason why you're even here, right? Is <laughs> because of this product. And then there is the CEO. This is the visionary. This is the one who is like creating the plan and where you want to go and directing all of the employees, which is <laughs> the third hat, the doer, the employee. And inside of that employee, there could be a social media manager, there is like the bookkeeper, right? And there is the salesperson. And many of you do not have skills in sales, and that's totally fine, um, not a problem. However, to do a business well, what you're doing, you are going to need to improve your sales. So that is what this next series is all about. I am bringing in people in the industry who are top at what they do. They are VPs of sales um, or they are people, my clients. Um, I'm going to bring in a couple of my clients who are small businesses who their owners, their founders just happen to, to be really good at sales. I know that it's easy to be like, well, some people are really good at it and some people just aren't. And I'm telling you that you can do all of it and you can learn and grow into this. It doesn't have to be your zone of genius forever, but I do think it is really important that at the beginning, do not farm this piece out. I don't even know how you would farm it out as a small brand. Um, it's very expensive to hire brokers or to bring in a sales team. So really at the beginning, just expect that you are going to have to be a salesperson. You are going to have to put that sales hat on. No one is going to be able to represent your product, your brand, as well as you. And so I want you to embrace this area and trust that this is part of the entrepreneurship journey. This is where you need to be. And honestly, if you're not willing to do that, I would probably just consider, frankly, going to work for somebody else. Um, bring your talents as a chef to another person's business. But if you are wanting to commit to being an entrepreneur, to wearing all of the hats, right? The chef, the employee, and the CEO, then we just have to work on how do we get better at sales? How do you lean into the discomfort of what you perceive as the icky sales piece? Because it's not. Um, that's a pretty small percentage of salespeople who are actually icky. <laughs> I'll just call it that. This is totally doable for you. And in fact, I want you to embrace it. You will look back one day and be like, remember when I was my own salesperson and I was approaching buyers? And honestly, your passion, your vision in the product is what's going to sell it at the beginning. 
All right. When you're working with farmers market people or retail buyers, it's you. So you have to be able to master this and then you can push it on to somebody else. Then you can bring in a sales team or hire a broker. The result I want from you taking in this information is not just to keep taking in more and more information. I know it gets easy. I know you guys sit there and go, well, if I just knew X, if I just knew more, let me just take in more and more information. The point of these this podcast, this series is to get you into action. I want to get you with enough information that you have the tools, that you feel confident, like you have the basics, right? That you know what you need to know, that you understand how the industry works and you kind of have those tips and pointers and we're going to talk about your mindset and some, some sales, um, learnings that I've had. Um, I'm not a natural born salesperson either. Uh, but really there is a way to do it and do it in a way that feels good. Before we jump into today's interview with Dylan Shetley, which is so great. I think you guys are going to love him. I do want to give a shout out uh, for a review, and I really want to encourage all of you, if you're getting value out of this podcast or the YouTube channel, please, please, please head over to either my Facebook page, Food Business Success, or go to Apple, uh, the podcast, and just go like you're on your phone, like you're searching for a new podcast, type in Food Business Success, and then write a review. I would love to give you a shout out and reviews really help me grow the awareness and reach more people just like yourself who want to launch and grow their dream packaged food business. Cindy of Masi Masa. I love their stuff. Actually, I'm going to the farmer's market shortly and I'm going to look for her and pick up another package of, of her amazing seasoning blends. And she says, there are some things you can figure out on your own and others where it's better to bring in a pro. Cindy says, there are some things you can figure out on your own and others where it's better to bring in a pro. Sari is not only knowledgeable, she is fast, super helpful, and patient. Highly recommend Sari. Thanks so much, Cindy. Your products are amazing. And you guys should definitely go check her out. All right. With that, we are on to the interview with Dylan. Really excited to have you on for this conversation about sales. And we're going to go in a lot of different directions with my guest today. Um, so I'm really excited to welcome on Dylan Shutley. And Dylan has worked in the food industry for just over 10 years, selling a number of established mid-market and emerging CPG brands. He started his career as a food broker, which I know is going to be such a great conversation uh, that we're going to have. And he was able to sell for hundreds of different CPG brands in a multitude of channels. Um, he worked with companies that have been around for over 200 years and then brand new emerging brands. And he's been able to establish and grow sales by building trusting relationships and telling a unique story that the brand has to offer. After moving to Colorado uh, in 2017, Dylan has enjoyed getting involved in the food startup scene, and he is a board member of Colorado Food Works. Uh, he's actually my vice president, so we have the, the president and VP right here today, and he loves talking shop and collaborating with companies no matter the stage that they're in. So this is going to be such a valuable conversation. Welcome, Dylan. Oh, Sari, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And um, just want to say, Sari, you've done a, an amazing job with Colorado Food Works and um, kind of taking it to our, our second generation, if you will, um, of the organization. So it's been an absolute joy to work with you and well, uh, spend a lot of time you. with you. Yeah, of course. And I couldn't do it without you. We're, we make a good <laughs> team. So, <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. yeah. So, we were just talking before we started recording. You were telling me about your experience um, being a broker. And, you know, I think you know, um, we've come, talked about this that a lot of the people listening here um, are brand new in the food industry. I work with a lot of people who are just getting started. And, 
they might just be thinking really simply along the lines of farmers markets or some some wholesale. Um, but it's so fascinating. First of all, I'd love to just kind of hear your experience as a broker and and what is it, you know, even define it for us. Um, but then we're going to talk about sales channels and kind of open people's eyes to a lot of different um, opportunities that they maybe haven't even thought of. So yeah, tell us a little bit more about, yeah, that first role you said you first job out of college. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. So it was, it was really um, an interesting time for me where straight out of college, I wanted to go into sales and I wasn't really sure what kind of capacity that I was going to be in. And um, a teammate of mine uh, actually um, was working at this firm called Shankman and Associates. And this is a brokerage firm. And for those of you who don't know what a brokerage firm is, um, is essentially think of any CPG company, food company that can't quite support a full sales team across the country or even regionally. Um, what they can do is hire on a brokerage firm. And the brokerage firm essentially has a portfolio of brands that they go and sell to their existing relationships, whether that's a distributor, whether that's an end user, um, meaning a restaurant operator, or if it's a grocery store or a C store, they basically have the relationship and then present their portfolio to those customers and to those partners. So uh, being a food broker kind of gives you uh, a really nice portfolio and a nice, a diverse background of what you can show folks. And you can really kind of uh, plug and play what makes sense for each customer. So it, it was a really enjoyable time and I got to represent some really cool brands. Um, and as you mentioned in the intro, you know, I've, I've one of my most recent jobs, I was at a company called Sanjay, which has been around since um, 1804. So it's over 200 <laughs> years old. It's incredible to think about their eighth generation owned. Um, and then I also represented brands like Tootsie Roll, which has been around for over hundred years. So, um, you know, Seeing and having visibility into what their sales procedures are, what their sales material are, um, what their go-to-market strategy is, and how it's evolved over the years has been it's a real insight that you have into these companies that have just kind of been that cash cow for so many years. It's been around, it's not going anywhere, and they continue to grow, albeit slow, but those brands continue to grow. And so when you have those established brands and you can piggyback off some of the newer ones. Um, you know, a good example of that back in my first brokerage days, um, we started representing a brand called Haichu Moringa, um, which was a, um, I'm sure a lot of your listeners might be familiar with, but it's like a better, um, starburst, if you will. And mm -hmm. It was a Japanese brand and it had just come to the U S. And so you go into one of these firms or a customer and you'd say, you know, here's your Tootsie Roll promotion for the quarter. Let's get you set up for the next six months. Oh, and by the way, we have this amazing new candy called Moringa. Um, and that was just a really nice way to kind of uh, present a brand and, and tell the story of, of what that brand is and how it could benefit their business. So, um, yeah, that just kind of shows a lot of the different brands that I had, um, not only in candy, but also in Better For You and Greek Yogurt. We represented Giovanni, um, Five Hour Energy. So it was kind of funny. We just had a, a, a really wide range of products, but they're all relevant. And that was a really you know, important piece to our portfolio is that our, our leadership team um, all had really great relevant brands that we could present to major customers in the region. So um, that was my first kind of sneak peek and my first introduction in the food industry. And I had growing up, I had no clue that I would spend my whole career in food. I had no, no sense of that, but, but here I am. And I have loved every second. Of yeah. It. You love it. Um, it's so interesting. There's actually, um, how I built this, you know, that podcast with Guy Raz on oh, yeah, uh, five hour energy. Um, mm -hmm. have you listened to that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Super mm -hmm. interesting. Um, talk about just like perseverance and like, <laughs> Just not yeah. giving up. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, I've actually represented a number of brands that have been on how I built this. And it's always fun when they come up because I've met a lot of the owners of these companies and you talk to them in person and then you hear them on how, how I built this. And they really are the same. It, they're not, it's not like, you know, they're, they're true to themselves and they're true to the brand through and through. And I think that's really cool. It's important for those brands that have been successful that, you know, have really, stay true to who they are and, and, you know, all things that I did that, that they do from messaging to marketing to, um, you know, their presence in the marketplace. So it's, it's really fun to, to hear when that comes on most recently. Um, there's one on new me tea, which was really quite fascinating mm. and, um, just how they came to market and how they actually got their first 
chance by getting into a major grocery chain by attending a trade show and building this beautiful exhibit. And that was it. And it's just so fun to hear those different stories. And um, they really kind of resonate with me. Yeah, that's so fun. You're like, oh, I know them. I know them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it. So how different does your strategy vary based on the sales channel? And just for anyone listening, um, C store is convenience store. Um, but maybe just kind of go through some of the channels and then I'm curious. Yeah. Like if you take any of those products, do you vary your strategy? Um, or how many sales channels should you even be looking at, especially when you're just starting? Yeah, that's a great question, Terry. Um, and I, I guess just to, to start, I go back a little bit almost as, you know, I've, I've worked in, as you mentioned, so the, the C store, convenience store channel, grocery channel, which are pretty similar. And then I also did some work in the food service channel for C store, which was pretty unique. And then also Mm -hmm. um, more later in my career, I focused a lot on strictly food service, which um, I'd be happy to talk about more. It's my real passion. I love getting into the food service space, but um, you know, when it came to C store and grocery, that was such a data driven sale. It was a very data driven as well as relationship driven. A lot Mm -hmm. of these old, and, and I don't want to say, it's kind of the old passing of the guard where um, a lot of these folks, we had a, a number of established relationships and you, it was just almost, we'd always call it protect and conquer. You'd always protect the space that you had. So if you knew you had five items, let's say in a planogram, a POG um, at, a, at a C store, you would make sure you offer all the relevant data, what that movement was, what that ACV was, how many ACV being, being how many units per store you're moving. And you're making sure that you, you present that data to your buyer for that product and then also present new data to say, hey, this product might help move that product, like a new one, or even um, tag teams, set up unique promotions. You know, we, we'd even do fun things like buy one, get one free on two totally different brands. But what we could do as a broker is you could collaborate, you know, buy one um, advanced peer hot sandwich and get a free Chobani or a Chobani for half off. Right. Half off. Oh yeah. I've you, seen those before. You're like, what? That's, <laughs> that's yeah. And it's, it's funny. products. <laughs> yeah, you like, they have no business being together, but as a broker, I, I, I wouldn't say that was an actual promotion I ran, but that's just the gist of it is you could be yeah. really creative in the sense of how you could grow your sales for not only existing products, but also get those emerging products, have them piggyback off those established brands and get them into the space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I so love that's, that. That's and that's C store and then right. groceries, um, similar as well. And I had the privilege of working with Jungle Gyms. Um, if any listeners have, have heard of Jungle Gyms, it's kind of a, it's almost a, what would you call that? Like a destination. It's mm. a massive, massive grocery store down in Cincinnati, Ohio, and they wouldn't have just like an authentic aisle. They would have two rows of imported German food that have three <laughs> rows of imported uh, Japanese food. And it was, it was just, in a, it was an old mall that they turned into a massive grocery store. And oh so that was gosh. a lot of fun just selling international brands into that space. Uh, I've got some hilarious stories of taking products over there. Uh, I'll tell you about those another time, but, um, but yeah, so it just, you know, it really was a unique time and um, selling into those grocery stores as well as C store had some similarities, but also a little bit different. Um, just as, as the data yeah. that you present to them and the type of promotions that you could run with those end users. Yeah. And uh, we have a great, there's a great podcast with uh, Doug Helbig, who's the, the founder of Colorado Foodworks, but we talk all a lot about data story. So I'll put that link uh, for that podcast in the show notes, but so important that you're going in to a store and even if you've never even gotten into one store that you're bringing data from maybe from your farmer's market or something that says, this is, this is why you want to keep this product on the shelf. Mm-hmm. And then once you start building data, I mean, you know, I was talking to a, a client yesterday and it's like, we want to be partners in that, in that relationship and keep moving that product. Like, how can we support our stores, because if you don't move, you're going to get mm-hmm. last chance discontinued, <laughs> pulled off the shelf. So super important that you're being a great partner and certainly brokers can help a lot with that as well. Definitely. And I'm glad you brought that up because it is so important that once you get a product in that you establish that, that ground space. And it's, again, it's kind of like that 
um, protect and conquer, like protect that space and do what you can, whether that's running a promotion, whether that's going into the store and doing a sampling, um, whether that's just, you know, telling all your friends and family to go and, and buy some of the product. Yeah. It's, it's important to make sure that the buyer that's sitting at the other end of the desk, when he just runs through his numbers and says, oh, look, this is a product that's moving and I need to continue to purchase more. Where if you get it in and just stop, a lot of times if you don't have the right messaging or the right proactive steps to continue its movement, it'll just sit there. Not mm-hmm. saying that your product's a bad product, but it's a crowded place. It's a crowded market space. And you know it's really important to stay on top of that and, and be proactive and making sure that that product's moving at a consistent consistent rate. Yeah, absolutely. We talked about some other things, especially when you're small, you know, you just, I said those first couple stores, you just want to baby the heck out of them. Like do everything you can in your power, stop by the store, go face the product, make it look great. Offer shelf talkers, of course, promotions, um, you know, use your social media, like said, tell friends and family, like you really want to show, oh, employee swag was another one, right? Don't be afraid to give out out promotion, like stickers and hats and samples and be really generous. Cause if you get those employees on your side, I mean, back in my days of whole foods, right? (laughs) Definitely. Especially like an independent small store. I used to go and do that and you know, I'd be in rural Ohio at a convenience store and I'd buy the, I'd buy all the workers, uh, whatever item I was selling and just give it to them and have them try it and ask what they think. Yeah. And if they liked it, I'd be like, all right, here's, and then I'll buy them another bag. And, and then they'd sit there and be eating it and customers would come by and be like, oh, I want that as well. And so it just kind of, it's, it's almost that word of mouth, you know, you kind of get that ball rolling and um, get that general interest there. And people just start to to take on to that. It's so, so important. Like you can't underestimate that power. Yeah. Hundred percent. How does it? And I want to get into the questions because you have some great questions too. But tell me about food service a little bit because I've been working with. I have some clients that it really does make sense. Their product makes sense to do either bulk or um, I have a gal doing pastries. Um, you know that would be amazing in coffee shops and things like that. And you know I did work in restaurants for a long time as well so I kind of understand that um that arena but I I was never doing the buying so I'm curious like like when you're dealing with chefs or owners how different is it than you know kind of retail where it's very like category reviews and kind of very structured yeah um it's not an easy question to answer but <laughs> What can you we tell can, us about? We can, service? we can go through that. No doubt. So in 10 you know, minutes or less. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Uh, three hours or less. Yeah. Go through it all. Um, you know, I think one of the best ways to start would be even just scaling the product or scaling the business from, and you can even look at it from a grocery or C store realm first. So think of like going into you're, you've got an initial few customers and maybe you're just shipping it to them on FedEx or UPS, or you're doing a DSD model where you're actually going into the store and delivering it yourself. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're going through that process. And the way to really scale that up is to get with a chain. And once you're in a chain, then it gives, it opens the door for a distribution route. So it opens that door for, uh, you know, some small grocery distributor to put you in their warehouse and then wholesale and they can get it to more customers. So the same thing kind of goes for food service. It's very challenging just to go to one restaurant and say, Hey, I've got this item. I want you to put it on your menu and we'll work together on usage and we'll figure out what makes sense best for you and how to get that product to you. As you scale up and you get into that food service realm, not saying that you have to start in grocery or retail, you can definitely start in food service, but it's very important to get with multiple operators, multiple multi-unit operators to start Mm. to really help ramp that up because you're going to get spread too thin. And there's, there's so many variables, especially now with the restaurants kind of in flux that it's very hard to, to manage and predict what the usage rate is going to be for a product in a food service channel. And additionally, it's not a very structured sales cycle. It's not like, oh, you know, we're going to go through a menu change. You see some restaurants that have had the same menu for 20 years, or you see some that have maybe one LTO, limited time offering. So it's very important to 
get with chefs, executive chefs, and tell them about your story and show a product that really fits their messaging and, and make sure it fits what you're trying to, how do I put this? What you're trying to sell. So, um, you know, if you're trying to sell a better for you product into a McDonald's, it just might not, obviously it doesn't make sense, but if, if you're really focused on a better for you product and you find that perfect brand that, you know, is it, there's just a really good marriage of the product and what their offerings are really, it, it takes a lot of time to nurture that process and get them yeah. samples and, and prove to them that this is why they should have it. This is how it's going to be more cost effective for you to put this on your menu, because it's not, a lot of the times you don't even know what that brand is. So for instance, I, I, when I was in the food service channel, I represented a lot of brands that were in the better for you space in grocery, but had gone on to move to food service. So just to name a couple of few or a few brands would be like Bob's Red Mill. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what Bob's Red Mill is, but they have a massive food service offering. Sure. Um, yeah. But most restaurants don't call out, this is Bob's uh, uh, oatmeal or whatever. So right. You know, it's, it's really important to understand if you want to have that brand image, you're not always going to get in that food service space. You're, you might, you might get a menu mention, but that's on really rare occasions. Impossible was on the first um, plant-based food brands I represented. And that was so easy to get a menu mention that kind of changed the, the landscape <laughs> for menu mentions, but um, it's just very different from the grocery where it's very brand facing right, right. To food service. It's not. Yeah. Actually my gal with the pastries was like, you know, should I require that they say that they're, you know, my pastries? And I was like, you can't, <laughs> you yeah. can't do that. You can show them the value of like <clears throat> being local and that they're supporting local and, you know, they try to show them the value and give them some signage, but they don't have like, <laughs> no, they don't, <laughs> they're not required. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's tough. And, you know, sometimes you can pay for that menu mentioned, but you know, what's your ROI and actually paying for that menu mention. But as I mentioned before, it's so important to, to focus on specific food service customers that really resonate with your brand. So yes. if it is a company or it is a restaurant that's saying we only source product from 200 mile or 200 mile radius from, let's just say Denver, then all, by all means, you should be targeting that customer. That's somebody that you 100% should be in front of. Um, but again, it's not, it doesn't make sense for all brands to be doing that. Um, but again, just making sure that, you know, your messages really resonate with that end user. Yeah, that's great. And, and I'm kind of going out of order here, but since we were kind of talking about distribution and, and whatnot, let's, let's just talk a little bit more about like, what is that growth plan as you're trying to scale and get into distribution? So maybe you can talk a little bit more about that or your, your best channel as you're starting out. Yeah. Um, one of the things I tell, and I, I, I just to kind of, again, go back to the start here, I love talking to brands. I, whatever the food brand is, and I, I should, I, I should probably be, I'm very open. I come from, moved here from Columbus, Ohio, and they always called it the uh, backyard effect where people would just be totally open to talk about business and give your best ideas and just collaborate. And so I've always been about that and always try to find ways to connect folks with other folks who might have a similar interest or, you know, anything along those lines just to help out in any way. So I love talking to brands. One of the first things I tell brands that I talk to is make sure that you're scaling at a reasonable rate and make sure that you can produce the amount of product that you need to scale mm -hmm. at that rate. One of the biggest challenges I've, I've had in my career is when you're actively selling a product and then all of a sudden you're out of stock. Yes. I won't mention the brand, but I had a a meeting here in Denver, and it was the fastest meeting I've ever had in my life. I had a client fly in from uh, an out of state and we sat down and the buyer said, when can I get this product? And we kind of fumbled with the answer and she said, okay, thank you. And that was the end of the meeting. She didn't oh ask gosh. another question. She stood up and walked out the door. But what happens is when you're, whether in retail or food service or in wholesale, you're owning a slot. You're owning a piece of real estate on that shelf, uh, in that kitchen, on that or in that warehouse. And if you run out of product and it's sitting there, that means there's multiple levels of customers who are losing money on that opportunity mm -hmm. or on that space. So when you're scaling up your business, you have to be extremely thoughtful as to which customers you're bringing on. 
And again, this kind of goes back to why data is so important. Making sure that you're understanding if I'm gaining 10 stores, if I'm getting 10 restaurants, what is that going to do to my volume? What do I need to do to make sure I'm scaling up? Because you, it, it's, it's twofold. You don't want to upset your current customers and you definitely don't want to upset your new customers because both times they're either going to say, thanks, but no thanks. You've had your shot, you're out, or um, we're just going to move on. We found a different supplier. So it's so important to scale and make sure you have all your ducks in a row before you grow too big. And I think that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs don't always think about. They kind of think about that end game, like we need to get in more stores. We need to sell more units. Yep. But if you do that too quickly and you don't have the backbone and the structure for it, it's going to come to hurt you much more in the long term than it would just to do it in a more organic growth way. Yeah, I always think back when I was working with Whole Foods and we would, I worked for the regional office and we would, um, my job was to find local producers for new stores. And as we moved into new areas and then, but sometimes like that would actually put people out of business. They were so excited to get on the stores, but then they had no growth plan. And it's such a tricky thing. It's like, well, I can't just like pull the trigger on making all this product or moving to a co-packer until I have the sales, but you have to, it's like, you almost have to have the plan, like ready to go, ready, (laughs) ready to execute. Like if you wait until you get the stores and then you're like, well, let me figure out now how I'm going to scale. It's too late. Like you said, you've lost your shot. So Mm -hmm. you really have to have that plan. Even if it's like, I'm not ready to go into a co-packer yet, but I can turn it on. Like it's ready to go. And yep. I've, I'm not like, oh, who should my co-packer be? <laughs> yep. And, and it, it's also important to know, and, and Doug has always been good to, to say this, but it's always, it's always good to know when to say no. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think as a brand, it would be st- extremely difficult if Rocky Mountain Whole Foods was like, all right, we're ready. You guys can come into all 30 of our stores, however many it is. And you know that you might be cutting it close or that you're maybe 70% of the way there. And it's, it's so hard as a business owner to sit there and say, you know what? I don't think this makes sense right now. I don't know if this is right for us to do this at this exact moment, but it's very important to do that if you know that it's not going to work out to Whole Foods best interest right away. If you can delay that, or if you can just say, maybe, you know, maybe in six months, or I need to build up my inventory, come up with an alternative plan to make sure. And again, it's, it's that trust and collaboration to say, look, like we very much appreciate you accepting us into your, into this slot, but I don't want to do you wrong and not give you what you need. So again, you got to be honest and you got to stay true to, your brand and, and yourself and what you're trying to sell, because it's going to do worse for you if you crash and burn and something like that, as opposed to saying no and really kind of waiting to make sure it's the right time. Oh my gosh. I love that. I know we had a, such a great clubhouse conversation. I wish we could record those because that was such a good one with uh, right. you, me, Doug and Brandon and Brandon brought up that uh, yes. And, or yes, but right. Like mm-hmm. I want to say yes, but I also know I can't deliver yet. So yes, and here's the plan. <laughs> Can we delay this by six months or whatever? Because it's, you are, I think people just see it at, like sometimes these sales is like, oh, I'm in Whole Foods. It's like, great, that's it. It's a one-time thing. And it's like, no, you're building a long-term partnership. And mm-hmm. part of that is that you are building trust, like you said, and, and that, um, that might mean that you have to have a hard conversation and say, I'm not quite ready. Um, and Mm -hmm. I know nobody wants to do that, but that is where I saw people have to close their doors. Cause not only do you have to, you have to get all the product up front, right. And your, your cash flow cycle is super long when you, every time you scale up. So, I always say you got to have a plan, a capital plan well in advance when you're mm-hmm. starting to, to do that. And when I help people get into um, Whole Foods, I'm working with a client now and they, they're willing to, they're reviewing us off cycle because they're really interested in the product. But I gave her a breakdown of like, this is how much it's going to cost to get into Whole Foods. Like mm. there's IX1 and there's free fills and there's promotions and XYZ. Like are you ready for that? Do you have the capital? Cause. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that's a great point is as an emerging brand or a startup company, 
how do you know what's best for you? How do you know if Whole Foods is your best route? What if it's e-commerce? And I don't know a ton on, on e-commerce, but what if it's e-commerce? What if it's C-Store? And I, I think that's, again, when you're coming up as a company, it's so important to understand your demographic and to understand who you're really trying to reach. And, you know, Whole Foods is, you know, especially in, in this better for you world that we're living in, especially here in, in Denver. And, um, you know, that's such a focus, but not all brands are like that. You know, there's so no. many brands out there. There's so many so different many other stores, different yeah. channels and organizations and, you know, finding out which one is best for you might not be as easy as you think. And, and I think some people just kind of start this career or this, this journey and they just think that they do what everybody else does, but there's so many different options. And I'm probably not the, the best one to touch on all those other options, but just know that there are, are other ones out there and that there's, there's more opportunities than just the typical route that you see a lot of big brands going right. through. So well, I think, isn't it five hour energy that he like tried to get it, you know, shopped it around. I think he went to a trade show and then he finally was a GNC or maybe it was C store that they built a display and it was like, you know, yep. that's where it took off, but it took a lot of trial and error and, mm-hmm. and trying out those different channels. Yeah. I think he started, it wasn't even a, it wasn't even a five, it wasn't five hour energy branded. It was vitamin shop right. or something along right. those lines, something totally different. And the product didn't change, but the branding and the messaging and the go to market strategy did, yeah. but he spent a number of years trying to get into the vitamin that Vita shop wholesale type of space. And finally, once he changed and realized that the five hour energy was where the consumers were really interested in the energy piece of it. He made that switch. And as soon as he changed it from, I don't know exactly what it was, let's just say vitamin to energy, it just took off. And he recognized that the C the C store space was exactly his demographic that he was looking for, where previously he was looking more towards health nuts, where right. now he was looking towards people who are on the road all the time, people who were maybe your blue collar a worker who was on yeah, a job driving site a truck or, or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and it just took off. And that brand was astonishing. I mean, it, when you looked at it from a square foot per uh, revenue, revenue per square foot, it was the most in a gas station, even more so than gas. Gas stations made a ton of money because they just put a tiny little display right next to the register and it would just sell like hotcakes. It would just go right off the right off the shelf. And it's just an incredible, that's an incredible story of a brand that pivoted, recognized what their target was and made that switch and capitalized on it. Yeah. So how do you, I mean, we kind of have said it's really challenging to choose your sales channel. Do you recommend like, let's just take your really small, you've maybe been at a farmer's market or... Um, you know, you're just starting out, like, is it okay to kind of throw spaghetti at the wall a little bit? And then when do you choose, or do you have any advice for that? I think when, you know, every owner is going to be different and they're going to know deep down what their gut's telling them. I think this is going to work here. I think this is going to work maybe over here. Maybe I'll try these three spaces. I don't know. I haven't worked with a brand that's literally just taking off going right. into, um, you know, from a farmer's market to a grocery store, so to speak. So I don't really know what that looks like, but one of the things that I would say is, and this is one of my questions I kind of wrote down earlier, but how do you get that creativity? How do you get that sales creativity to sell a product and really understand what your consumer is thinking of it, what the review of the product is, how you're, how you're having a, you're building that relationship almost with your consumer to, to see what they're finding about the product. Why do they like it? Where would they buy it? Mm-hmm. And you're going to have those few champions at the beginning, people who just absolutely love what you're doing and, and work with them. They're going to be open and honest with you. They've got nothing to gain or lose, essentially. You know, Maybe offer them a free case of product, whatever it is. But get, have their insights and have them help you guide where you think it should go. And I think that would be a really good place to start they're the ones that are buying, they're the consumer. And, you know, they see products all the time. They go to Whole Foods, they go to C stores, they go, you know, online, but for whatever reason, there's people who are very interested in what you have to sell, ask them why, and, and have them help guide you. And they'll give you honest feedback. And I think that would be a really good place to start and Mm -hmm. kind of um, take that and learn from them. Right. 
Yeah, that's great. And I guess I, you know, I would recommend it's okay to try some different things, but recognize every sales channel you go down is a potentially a different kind of investment. I mean, certainly an investment of time, um, everyone you choose, and then it can be a little different investment in money, right? Displays or, um, just how you structure it, you know, maybe it comes in different packaging for food service versus Mm -hmm. consumer facing. So recognize that they're all going to potentially take different resources. Um, so I definitely recommend like, it's okay to try some, but then going deep and constraining and not trying to do them all at once, because I'm sure, you know, a lot of yours, like, it sounds like they were started and some of them started in grocery and then they wanted to add C store or, ad food service. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because it, you definitely don't want to get pulled in too many different directions. And again, I think that might be a place where you might run into some challenges. So again, getting with your consumers, figuring out where they think it will be best, where they think that they would be most in tune and most, you know, probable to buy, <clears throat> excuse me, to buy that product, I think makes a lot of sense, but you don't want to you don't want to just throw it at every single channel at once because then you're just going to get spread too thin and nothing's really going to stick. So yeah. maybe pick one, maybe two, go deep into both of those. And then, you know, if, as time goes by, if you're not satisfied or you think it can be better, pause and figure out what your next step should be. But don't just hear something online and say, oh, I think I should go into e-commerce. I'm going to start to do that right now. Because then it just, you, you don't have a plan. Make sure you're it's structured and you have that plan and that vision to really capitalize on it and do do it in the the best way possible. Yeah. The one I've had um, clients, uh, not even mine, but a few of them have considered it, but uh, is going on like Home Shopping Network or QVC. Oh, yeah. It's like a shiny object that they, you know, they present and it's like going to be all these great things. And I've watched other brands do it and they, they like put all their other stuff on pause, they ramp up and then it hasn't always been as successful (laughs) as as promised. So that's like, like, yeah, I would say don't get distracted by shiny objects. Like pick, I like, I like, I would say two max and like go deep. And then when you get really good at it, then add another one or evaluate, but give it some time. You got to give it some time for sure. And and do it well, give it all your effort into each of those, whatever channel it's going to be, give it time. You know, it's, it's not, it's not always a sprint. It's a marathon. Sometimes you gotta, you gotta give it time. You gotta nurture it and grow it organically. And you gotta, as we said earlier, you gotta promote it. You gotta go into the store. You gotta make sure that you're giving all that each package needs to have its own time and effort dedicated to it. And if you are in a grocery store and then you're doing stuff on TV and all of a sudden you're not focused on one thing or the other, it's just going to get lost in the shuffle. So you're, you're totally right. Focus on one thing. Um, and do it really, really well, and then focus on something else if it, if it's not making sense right there. Right, right. Be willing to reevaluate. But I just people are like, I don't know, I don't know what decision to make, and I'm like, make a decision, <laughs> <And> now <laughs> take action. Miles. Yeah, right. Just don't change course until you've taken enough action that you actually like. When you get feedback, you're like, okay, maybe this, you know. But that's how we pivot, right? But it has to be a decision and yeah. then there has to be action. <laughs> yeah. So. And, it's, and it's funny. It's a tough, I mean, it's a tough ask deciding which channel to go into. And a good example of this is impossible and beyond. And these are the yeah. two names in plant-based foods and one beyond decided to go into the plant and into the grocery channel first and impossible to decide to go in the food service first. Yeah. And they're both extremely successful companies and they're both extremely good products but they just decided on a different channel. And obviously that was a space that was pretty low in competition and they did very well on each of those channels, but it could have been reversed. You know, one of them could have done one of, you know, part retail and part food service. They've, they've now since done that, but let's say beyond was like, you know, we're going to go into food service and retail to start, and then they wouldn't be the company that they are today. It's, so it's very important to focus on, and learn from brands, you know, see what a brand has done and, and just recognize when, you know, maybe, maybe there's a piece of that story that makes sense for you. And you're going to kind of piggyback off that and, and go down that route. But um, you're right. Just, you know, focus on one thing and try to try to, you know, do it till it's, till it's right. Yeah. Yeah. 
you either just keep, keep pedaling, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. took this bike ride. Um, I rented a bike lot this weekend and it was the crappiest bike. And I was like, <laughs> I know where I am and I know where I need to go. If I just keep pedaling, <laughs> I don't stop. I will get there. <laughs> Uh, yep, just, that's right. I looked that's ridiculous. Right. You're, gonna, you're gonna be out of breath. You're gonna be sweating. But you know, like you, you don't have an option at the point. Like, yeah, what am I gonna turn down? Turn around now? Like, I'm already 95 percent of the way there. Make sure you get there. Just get get there. there. Make sure it's right. Keep pedaling. Tell me a little bit about telling your story and 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 how important that is as you're um going into say. I mean, it's odd. Like, I, I'm sure people are like when you at the very beginning, you're like. Um, I wanted to go into sales and I know I, people were just like, Oh, like I have people <laughs> literally like viscerally get, you know, s- nauseous or think about sales. And, and I, I'd love to just hear, um, you know, how important or how you've done such a great job and, and kind of rock that sales territory, mm-hmm. um, and how telling your story fits into that. Yeah, it's, you know, every brand is built with love and passion. And in, there's a product that's, that's the, what would you call that? The, the, uh, the fruit of that work. And some people just forget that. And they, they forget that their story is unique to everybody else's. Unless it's, you know, ConAgra, who just came up with a new brand doing this, whatever. But as a, as a small company, you've got a story to tell. Yeah. and you know, there's salespeople walking into restaurants, there's salespeople walking into grocery stores and the buyers, and they're all trying to sell a product. But the thing that sticks is a story. And it, it can be a simple story of how you started or why you started the brand or why you picked this flavor or any, anything that makes your brand stand out or different than another one. And, and I think that's such an undervalued process piece of the process of, of selling a product into an end user. So, you know, that story is so important and it's really important to not only make sure you have it down internally, but also when you continue to scale to make sure other people know what that story is, whether it's on the packaging, whether it's on the, the salespeople that you, that you hire or the brokers that you hire. But if that story is consistent and it, and it moves through the process of a sale, then it really resonates down to the consumer. And I, and I really take note in that. And I, and I feel like those stories just seem to me, you know, you're not selling a product, you're selling a person, you're selling a family or whatever it is. And, and some companies just don't have that. And it's, it, it's so cool being a small company where you can. So don't, don't forget that and don't lose that site and present it every chance you get. And sometimes you hear people say the same story over and over and over again, but you know, they're talking to different people. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's just so important to keep that top of mind and sell that story and just present it in a way that makes sense. And sometimes you'll sit down and a buyer is going to be, you know, part of your story might be, Oh, we're a B Corp. Okay, great. This buyer's like, Oh, I, I love B Corps. I've worked with 10 of them before, or this other person's like, well, I don't care about a B Corp. I don't even know right. what it is. I so, <laughs> so tailor that story when you're sitting down with it, you know, you're building that trust and that relationship. So tailor it to them and you know what, you know, all the, the, the facets of what you're going to tell, but just make sure it's tailored specifically to each customer, whether it's sustainability or it's gluten-free, you know, there, there's always a message that's going to resonate with somebody. Make sure a story's broad, but specific in a sense that here's why you should be buying it because mm-hmm. of X, Y, Z and just plug and play and figure out what that buyer wants to hear and and really harp in on that. Yeah. Uh, in food business success, I call, I have a whole module on defensively unique. So it's every, it's, you know, it might be you as a brand owner, your, your story, right? Like you, you know, I think of like Jackson's honest came to mind when I, when I was thinking about that, but um, like their family story, right. Or it could be the, the seasonality or the variety or where this comes from, or your connections, your influence, um, the sustainability aspect, the packaging, like come up with, you know, a number of those that you can speak to, and then you can kind of tailor them based on, based on the buyer Mm -hmm. for sure. But 
but yeah, that's what sticks in people's minds, right? It's like, it's not just, I'm sure I was thinking of Chobani too. I mean, I can't imagine when they were just starting, right? Like, um, or going into sea service or, um, seafood, seafood that, um, that they, uh, you know, you had to come up with, like, tell a story, like, why would a, a sea store want yogurt? Yeah, <laughs> and why exactly. this yogurt? Right. Exactly. And, and again, that's such a, that's a really good point because if you're, if you have a very unique product an emerging space, you might not have the data. You might not have that story to tell specifically on how well it's selling just yet, but you need to be able to tell that story of here's why you should give it a try. Yeah. And, and Chobani is a good, a great example of that because what, well, you know, who's buying, who's buying Greek yogurt at a C store, but we had done a lot of research and figured out that there's this shift from demographics going into not all C stores, but maybe your AC stores, you know, your, um, your young professionals who are just looking for a quick bite, you know, yep. yeah. traditionally they would just look, you know, I'll take banana, whatever sitting there. Oh, there's a Chobani here. I, maybe I'll grab that. So it's, it's, it's finding that story of here's how the landscape shifting and here's how my brand's going to fit into that shifting landscape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so good. Um, anything else on uh yeah, story or um kind of some of your your sales? I know people get a little like, I don't want to be salesy. And I actually throw out this quote that I'd love to hear your feedback on, but um, or not a quote, but like an equation that I heard, right? Where sales equals connection plus certainty. So how does that, how would you kind of interpret that? In, in- I, I love that quote um, or that equation, I should say. <laughs> so for, for me, you know, the certainty piece goes back to that, that scale, you know, or that, that ability to make sure that we can get you the product when we promise we can get it to you. You know, that's, that's so important. And then the other piece is the connectivity. And it's, it's really funny when, when I tell people I'm in sales, they were like, oh my gosh, must be so hard. Or, you know, I, I'm just not salesy enough. But I, most of my friends and family, if you if you ask them, they're like, you're not salesy at all. But you know, all that I do is that I listen and I, all I I sit across the desk from somebody, I ask some questions and, and I listen and I listen to what they're telling me and what they're saying and what they're looking for. And just really be patient and, and you, you connect with them in that sense, because if you're sitting there just trying to sell what you have, it might not make sense for them. You know that it makes sense for them, but you have to let them know that it makes sense for them. So you have to sit and connect with them, build that relationship. And again, it's, it's that connection piece. Like I said earlier, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense for us to connect right now. Maybe we should wait, but let's just start that relationship. Let's build off of this and organically grow together when it makes sense. But that connectivity piece is so important where, you know, you don't need to be pushing a product down somebody's throat. You know, it just, it doesn't work. I know of one brand that it worked and it was a beef jerky brand. They came into a meeting, threw a bag of beef jerky at the buyer and said, you need to put this on your shelf. And they should, they were even late to the meeting. And he looked at him was like, excuse me. And they just berated him. And he's like, all right, whatever, I'll put it on. And it did very well. So that was like a one-off story, but you know, the longevity of, of building that relationship and making sure that product is successful is you don't want to just throw something out there at a, at a buyer or a consumer and um, just hope that it works, but just connect with them, tell them, show them why it, it works for you. And, um, and here's what I'll do to help you get that and uh, make sure it's reliable. So that right. definitely equals success. Yeah. Yeah. And that certainty can come in the form of trust. It can come in the form of, you know, I'm going to guarantee sales or I'm going to, here's what we're doing to make sure we meet the demand or all the things that we've talked about. Right. But that is how you can convey certainty because a buyer is taking a risk. And this is what I always tell people is they have a limited, it's real estate. They have a limited amount of real estate. And if they, they don't just have like empty shelves yeah, <laughs> when right. you ever walked in and there's just like, an empty slot in the granola aisle, right? It's like, no, they have to consider, okay, does it make sense to bring in this new brand that I don't know? Um, I don't know anything about them. They don't have this track record or I have an existing one that's doing okay, you know? And so they have to weigh that out. And the more you can transfer certainty and build up relationship and trust, it's going to really serve you. 
and to kind of put those two together is you can kind of put those into the same equation in the sense of if you build that relationship on the sense of connectivity and then also grow a plan, <clears throat> excuse me, grow a plan into that to say, here's how I'm going to help this be successful. Here's how I'm going to make it succeed. You've got a backup plan. So now you've got, you've built trust as well as a plan to prove that your product's going to work and be transparent and honest, you know, maybe set benchmarks, maybe set a meeting in three weeks or three months and just say, look, look, let's sit down and talk about this. I know your time's busy. You're, you know, you've got a lot going on, but you have a lot of granolas. Let's just say a lot of granolas to choose from. Here's why it should be mine. And here's how I'm going to sit down and be a face for you and connect with you and show that this isn't just a granola. This is Dylan's granola. And here's how I'm going to really help you show that and build that plan to kind of backfill it as well. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'd love to wrap up with, um, I, we didn't talk about this, but I, I, a conversation about community and I'm, we'll, we'll do a little plug for Colorado food works. If you're in the Denver or even Colorado area, but wherever you are, whether, and I mean, I have a community group inside food business success, um, and there's lots of other community groups around CPG, um, in different States around the country. So I, I just love to kind of hear your take on why we talked a little bit about this at our board meeting, but how, how has community and networking with other brands, do you feel like it has contributed to your success and do you see it helping others? A hundred percent. One of the reasons why. I stayed in the food industry. I actually left for a little while, but came back was because I loved the relationships in this food community. I would go to trade shows when I was young and would just meet these people and they'd be genuinely interested in you. And they just want to collaborate and talk and, and talk shop. What's working for you? What's not working for you? How can I help you? And that space isn't the same in other industries. And that's what makes the food industry so unique and so special is that, you know, we're just trying to do good for, especially in the better for you world and this, this healthy space, we're just trying right. to do better for everybody. And, you know, your success is, is our success. And yeah. so the community can be as big or as small as you want it to be. And, you know, Colorado food works is a great platform for that locally, but, you know, anywhere in the country, you can find that community, whether it's, going to the farmer's market, or if it's going to, you know, just going to talk, you know, talking to a local restaurateur, you know, it's, it's such a close knit community and food, food's about passion and love. It's not about, right. it's not always about the, the bottom line, you know, obviously it is to some degree, but you know, people are passionate about this space and that community, that sense of shared, um, I don't know, success really starts with the community and it and it grows with everybody and be going to trade shows is a great way to to meet and expand your community you know you right. can talk to anybody in in the space and um you know they'll be happy just to you know give you their opinion or their thoughts i, I would recommend that to anybody if you've got a brand even if it's going to talk to the competitor or somebody who's been in the space for, you know, 15 years, they're the, they're the established brand, go and talk to them. You know, they're, they're not gonna, they're, they're gonna know that, you know, you're not going to take their space, so to speak for a little while, or they're just going to want to, you know, collaborate with you and chat. So that that's the sole reason why I, I love the food industry and just the community that you can build and the folks that I've met, I've got lifelong friends here in this, in this um, community, just for meeting at trade shows or meeting some of my you know clients and their friends that they know. It's just a, it's a very close knit, close knit crew. Yeah. I have found the CPG world to be very generous, to be um, very giving, yeah, very giving of their time. And, and then, you know, uh, knowing that people have helped them and they want to pay it forward. And, and that's part of it. Like you go in like, okay, I'm, I need help, but I also want to be I'm going to be open and available to help others as I keep going in my journey. And I've definitely seen a lot more. I mean, I could, well, a lot of you guys are on the board, the people who value community. And, and then we have those, those meetings, you know, we got together in person and, and you were able to be like, 
I mean, we all, we all were having conversation about like, oh, what do you do in this case? And what about you, this broker? And who do you recommend here? And, oh, you have a connection at Whole Foods or, you know, I mean, it was just amazing to see that and, and so fun. And I just think like, what an easy, um, it's just an, an easy thing to do to actually get involved in community. It's mm-hmm. like, other than your time, it really doesn't <laughs> cost that much. Right. I mean, $25 a year. For <laughs> yeah. Food works. Like, yeah. It's like, well worth it. And I, I do see a lot of people not take advantage of it though. I mean, whether it's our group or other people's Slack groups or in person or whatever, it just seems like such a no brainer. Yeah. And I don't know, if, I don't know if it's people feeling that they need to protect themselves a little bit or, um, you know, they just might not feel comfortable sharing where they're at, where again, the food industry, we've all had our problems. Like we all have our issues and, and it's a 99% chance that somebody's going through the exact same thing. We had the same, yep. like you said, at our board meeting last week, we had the same conversation. Oh, you're going through this. So am I, I never would have guessed you were having that same problem, Yeah. but it's just being open and sharing that and building that, that space where you can do it. And I think that's so important. And, um, you know, a good way to kind of show just how, inclusive this space is if you look at investment dollars in the past two three years there's been so much money going into the food space and a lot of the investors that i've spoken to they say that they want to work with food people because they're so nice and because yeah. that they're very open and willing to talk about their business so it's not just the people who are in the industry there's a lot of people on the outside looking in saying mm. oh man i wish i would have done that or <laughs> you know i wish i would be in that space because it just seems like a such an enjoyable place to be in and it truly yeah. is and it can be just such, and it can be a really lonely space. So come on, go, totally. go find a community. That's my, yeah, <laughs> that's my message. Be willing to give and be open, but then know that other people I think are very generous in this mm-hmm. industry. So don't do uh, this alone. <laughs> yeah. I, I always say that, you know, I, I, anybody who's got a brand of your listeners, I'm always willing for a coffee or a beer to go and just talk shop. Like I, could just do it for hours. And, you know, <laughs> maybe I'm not always right, but if I'm just a sounding board and you need to just express some of your frustrations, I'd love to hear them. And, um, you know, just be somebody who's there for you and just be part of the community. Yeah. I love that. I know. Well, I could keep talking to you forever on this stuff. It's been a pleasure, but our, our time is up and I'll let you get back to your, your day job. But, um, thank you so much for sharing what you did today. I know it's going to be super helpful. I really appreciate your time today. No, Sarah, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And, uh, looking forward to doing more good things with you at the Colorado food works and yeah. building our community. Absolutely. Well, that was amazing. I hope you guys got so much out of that. Dylan's just a wealth of knowledge and I appreciate how open and (laughs) transparent he is and just really has a big heart to help others succeed in this industry. If you are in Colorado, you definitely should join Colorado Food Works and come out and see us, uh, come mingle with other CPG brands. And as I was listening to this episode and I've been planning out the other episodes coming up, I I have an idea, (laughs) this is not fully baked yet, uh, to run a sales workshop. And in it, we will get into more kind of nitty gritty, look at exactly what you need and do some role playing make sure you're really prepared to go in and talk to buyers and also how to improve your sales at farmer's markets. So uh, like I said, it's not fleshed out. (laughs) It's not fully baked by any means. But if you are interested, uh, why don't you go ahead and go over to foodbizsuccess.com forward slash sales And we will start a sign up uh, list there. So if you are interested, you can just put your name on the list and then I will um, let you know if we end up, if we get enough interest and uh, let you know if we decide to run a program like that. I think it could be really valuable for you to get experience, practice, 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 right? That's a huge piece of sales and just getting yourself more comfortable uh, talking about your product, pitching, talking about the return on investment, the ROI, and all of that other good sales lingo, as well as knowing all of the 
details and the margins and all the things that buyers want to know. All right. I love it. This podcast is so fun when I get to just (laughs) do things on a whim. Why not? Uh, So foodbizsuccess.com forward slash sales. If you're interested in something like that, uh, we'll put the link in the show notes as well. And until next time, have an amazing week. Are you ready to start that delicious idea that you make in your home kitchen or grow your existing packaged food business and take it to the next level. The most successful food business entrepreneurs have support, guidance, focus, and accountability to help them make it happen quickly without wasting time or money. Plus, I think starting your packaged food business should actually be fun. Food business success is your secret ingredient to creating your food business dream. Please don't go this alone. Check out the private free Food Business Success Facebook group to connect with other foodpreneurs, get your questions answered quickly, share your wins, and receive special training and tools I only share inside the private community. Just search for Food Business Success on Facebook or get the link in the show notes. Curious about how Food Business Success can help you? head over to foodbizsuccess.com and fill out the application to see if you're a great fit for the program. Together, let's make your food business dream a reality.